We are about to start. And for those of you who have been here for almost two days, thank you very much for coming. You can, can you hear me now? Yes. As you know, the book festival is free, but donations are essential. There are great survival kits for sale and water bottles, and those will also help support the book festival and keep it going. There is still food for sale. There are a lot of food sources so that we're not running out. Um, we are going to have questions at the, towards the end of this discussion. And Ruth will be signing books in the tent, which is right behind us. And the books are available in the book sale tent. And please buy the author's books. This um, helps them, obviously, continue to be wonderful writers and to support them. So I'd like to begin by introducing Joan Nathan, who will look at you, is a, is a James Beard award-winning author of 11 cookbooks, including her latest work, King Solomon's Table, a culinary exploration of Jewish cooking from around the world that I believe um, was considered here at a previous book festival. In her previous cookbook, Quiches, Kugels, and Couscous, My Search for Jewish Cooking in France, was named one of the 10 best cookbooks of 2010 by NPR, Food and Wine, and Bon Appetit magazines. She's a regular contributor to the New York Times and Tablet magazine. She is also a member of the Martha's Vineyard Book Festival Advisory Board, and she will introduce her friend Ruth. It's always nice to speak to you because there's so many friends of mine from tennis, from swimming. It's great. Um, first of all, I'd like to give a shout out to Sue Ellen to have the good sense to bring Ruth Reichel here today. <laughs> We've had a wonderful few days together. Uh, straight from the plane, I took Ruth to Gray Barns and Mermaid Farms, the yin and yang of local farms, where she tasted their cheeses, mango lassie, and bacon brioche. Of course, the, uh, the person who was selling it, didn't he ask me if there was such a thing as bacon holla? I said, no, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope you all know, by reading Ruth's funny poignant and deft memoirs that she was born in New York, went to the University of Michigan, my alma mater, <laughs> mastering in fine arts, and became a cook in the 1970s, not a chef, opening a restaurant with friends called The Swallow in what is today the gourmet ghetto of Berkeley. Writing for New West Magazine, she caught the attention of the LA Times and they asked her to be restaurant critic and in, in 1984, right? And later, both food and editor and restaurant critic. In 1993, Arthur Salzberger Jr., he did it himself, right? Lured her back to New York and the imperial position of New York Times restaurant critic, where she reigned until 1999, when the late Cy Newberger invited her to lunch at the Four Seasons to become editor-in-chief of Gourmet Magazine, with all the regalia that this now end-of-an-era job entailed, where she remained, and it was abruptly sh shuttered in 2009. She has also written 11 books, including her best-selling beloved memoirs and a 1,000 recipe edition of Gourmet that she will tell us about. We are all keeping our fingers crossed that there will soon be a Netflix series about Ruth's life. <laughs> Most important for us on Martha's Vineyard is that Ruth has spent many happy summers in Aquina with her family and bemoans the bat passing of the Menemsha bite. Oh, I can't tell you how disappointed I am about that. Like MFK F Fisher, Ruth's writing exhibits a great love affair with food, paying attention to every nuance, every unfolding texture, all delicious ingredients of her writing. But also, like MFK Fisher, she does so not in a solitary context, as if obsessed with food, but uses commentary on food 
and its mores as a social commentary on our times, which leads us to her latest book, Save Me the Plums, and she'll tell you if you ask how she got the name. Um, some of you heard that yesterday. Um, so, uh, hold on a second. Um, wait a minute, hold on a second. <laughs> Uh, oh, a delicious read that we'll, we will talk about today. And by the way, make her apple pancakes. All right, let's get straight to our first question. Okay. Can you tell us about why you took on this job at Gourmet, giving up the times, and did you have any hints that Gourmet was going to close? Well, to start with the second, none. And I still can't believe that Condé Nast chose to close a almost 70 year old institution that there is literally not a day of my life in the 10 years since it closed that someone has not come up to me to say how much they miss the magazine. Oh. I think you've got to either speak louder or... Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, okay. Um, I will put it right up to my mouth. Um, I, I still just, I find it still baffling that Condé Nast chose to close a brand that was so beloved by the public. And it seems to me, you know, they could have fired me, gotten rid of the entire staff, but I, I'm still really gobsmacked by the fact that Gourmet is no more. Uh, when they came after me to be the editor-in-chief, I said, look, I love this magazine. Um, I, the magazine, I discovered Gourmet when I was eight years old, and um, it literally changed my life because it showed me that food could be a way of looking at the world. And um, my mother, who had no interest in food whatsoever, thought it was ridiculous for an eight-year-old to have a subscription to this magazine. <laughs> uh, um, but um, it, it had really meant so much to me. So when they came after me and they said, you know, we think that we need a new editor. And I actually did not know at the time, but I later found out that um, why they needed a new editor was Gourmet had a virtually le legendary renewal rate. I mean, people just renewed it for the rest of their lives. And it was like the New Yorker. I mean, it was just, there were gourmet families. And right before I got there, the renewals had gone down a little, just a little. But for the first time in the magazine's history, there had been a dip. And when they did some research, they discovered that their readers were dying. <laughs> and so they realized that they needed to bring in new, younger readers. Um, had I known anything at all about magazines, I would have known that the hardest thing to do is to get new readers without alienating the old ones. Um, people who love the magazine don't want to see any changes, and people who don't love the magazine want to see total changes, and it's a really hard dance. But what I said to them was, I love this magazine, it's an important magazine, it's an important moment in food in America, it was 1999, and I said, you know, this is what I think you should do with the magazine, you should be talking about science and anthropology and gender and race, and there's so much to talk about that goes beyond, you know, fancy vacations for people and, you know, really complicated recipes. And they said, that's why we want you to be the editor, because these are all great ideas, and I said, but, I don't know anything about editing, and um, get someone who knows what they're doing. And that would not be me. And I kept saying it over and over again, no, I don't want this job. And of course, the more you say to billionaires like Cy Newhouse that you don't want what he has to offer, the more determined he is that he is going to get you to, to do his bidding. So eventually, um, I said, yes, I would take over the magazine, um, not really having any idea what it was that I was in for. What were you in for? 
So when I got there, the magazine had basically been edited from the top down. So the three people at the top decided on everything that was going into the magazine. And then they just went around to the editors and said, here, you do this and you do that. And the staff had no real input into what was going into the magazine. And in fact, when I got there, the articles editor very proudly took me to a cabinet and said, see, here, here are the articles for the next two years. And they're all edited and shot. And I said, for two years? <laughs> I mean, that's just, it's crazy. But that's the way they did it. And she said, some magazines like to think that they're timely. Gourmet likes to think of itself as timeless. And I said, I don't think this is a moment for a timeless magazine. We really need to be dealing with the modern world. And I said, we're going to call a meeting. And my managing editor said, well, you know, they've never had a meeting at Gourmet. <laughs> um, so you better be prepared. And, and there's not a room large enough for the entire staff. And you better be prepared to do a lot of talking. And so I got in there prepared to talk. And I said, you know, this is our magazine. We can do anything we want with it. What do you think we should do? And I didn't open my mouth for another two hours. I mean, the staff reinvented the magazine. I did not. I, I just said, you know, this is, we're going to do this together. And they wanted to do, I mean, I was in a room with the smartest, most passionate food people. And I was just, we're going to do this, all of us together. And there's nothing more fun than working with a bunch of creative people. Um, but um, in the first year, the old readers hated what we did. And they wrote in in droves to say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I hand wrote letters to every single person who complained and said, please stick with us. I'm glad you care enough to write to us. Please keep writing. And eventually, most of them came around because by the time we closed, we had the highest circulation in the magazine's history. Wow. So when, when you had these meetings, I'm just curious about this. Some, some of us loved the, the centerfold, which I know you, uh, you took out. Were there, were there comments about that? The centerfold? I didn't take the centerfold oh, out. It was still out. It was still there. Okay, I mean, no, we did, we did these you know, photo we, shoots, those, right. these beautiful... And in fact, we made them more elaborate. We went on location, and um, I mean, I thought of them as food porn, basically. And, <laughs> um, and in fact, um, when I got um, my final art director, who was there for the last seven years, um, you know, he said to me, you know, we should be scripting these like, like films. And we did. We storyboarded them, and, you know, we sort of figured out, you know, what, what conversations were being happen were happening around the table. And I sort of imagined people lying in bed at night dreaming themselves into these photographs. Because I, I remember growing up and in my young married life, just made on like New Year's Eve New Year's Eve make giving everybody a different recipe to make and and I also remember once that this friend of mine made all of those recipes for all gourmet magazine recipes for her in-laws 50th anniversary. Now her in-laws were immigrants from Poland and she spent so much time making these perfect recipes. I wasn't gonna say this, but I'm sorry. And um, when she made the recipes, everybody loved them that was at that time my age, which was much younger, but all the older people said there was no food to eat. Oh, well. <laughs> But, you know, we not only continued doing them, but Epicurious this year has, you know, we have, in magazines, you shoot a year ahead uh, because you can't shoot Thanksgiving in the middle of summer. Mm -hmm. So we shot, you know, the summer recipes the summer before, and so we would have, you know, beautiful summer landscapes to shoot in. And so we had the, the major centerfold sh meals shot 
um, for the last year, and Epicurious has found them, and they're starting to print them. So they printed the Christmas one, which um, had four appetizers and I think five desserts. <laughs> it was very elaborate. And they've, they're just about to print um, a July uh, or August shoot. Huh, interesting. Um, in your book, you describe so well the difference between the times and the cultures of Condé Nast. Of all the differences, what was the biggest change for you between being a food writer and an editor-in-chief? And what were some of the changes you tried to initiate at Condé Nast? Maybe you want to talk about the David Foster Wallace's and his lobster story. Um, Boy, that, that is a, that, that's, a, that's a lot of questions. So uh, let me start with DFW because everybody is interested in what it's like to work with David Foster Wallace. Um, and one of my editors, Jocelyn Zuckerman, came to me and said, and she got, I mean, she was our literary editor and she, she read everybody and she went after everybody. So we got, you know, through Jocelyn, amazing people wrote for us, you know, Chimamanda uh, wrote for us, and Gary Steingart wrote for us, and uh, Jane Smiley, and on and on. And one day she said, um, I want to see if David Foster Wallace will write for us. And I said, you know, you know, Godspeed to you, but I can't imagine that David Foster Wallace wants to write for Gourmet. Well, sure enough, he did want to write for Gourmet. And we spent a long time trying to find the right story for him. I mean, originally we thought we would send him to the Oxford Food Symposium to cover that, and that didn't interest him. And then Jocelyn said, well, you know, he's from Maine. His mother is from Maine. Maybe he'd like to go cover the Maine Lobster Festival. And to all of our surprise, he did want to cover the Maine Lobster Festival. And he started, um, he would leave long messages for Jocelyn in the middle of the night. And I said, you know, do you think he's calling in the middle of the night so he doesn't actually have to talk to a living person? <laughs> and she said, well, probably. And then the piece comes in and Jocelyn comes in and we can hear her from down the hall. We can all hear her laughing uproariously with the piece. And then she comes into my office and she, she, there's a look on her face I don't quite understand. And she's carrying this huge tome. And I said, you know, were we expecting 10,000 words? And she said, well, no, you know, we assigned it at 3,000. But, you know, it's David Foster Wallace. He does what he does. And I said, well, how is it? And she said, you better read it. <laughs> and... I had no idea, and I, and I, it, the beginning is wonderfully funny, and I'm laughing away, and suddenly he comes to this place where he says that um, lobsters, because we bring them into our kitchens alive, are the freshest food we ever eat. And then he proceeds to go on <laughs> at great length about what lobsters feel going into the pot, and the bioethics of eat, and then he goes from there to the entire ethics of eating animals. And um, you know, is it correct for us to eat animals purely for our gustatory pleasure? And then he stops as he's considering this and says. Um, I very much doubt that the readers of Gourmet Magazine want to read these subjects in the middle of their culinary monthly. And I'm sitting there as the editor thinking, you're right about that one. <laughs> and it was for me a really difficult moment because it was a brilliant piece. And it was also a piece that I thought um, hundreds of thousands of people were going to write in and say, cancel my subscription, because this, is, this isn't what I want to read in a food magazine. On the other hand, it seemed like a really important piece, and I struggled with myself, and then he and I had a fight about 
uh, Jocelyn couldn't get him to take some things out that were really things that I really thought we need, like any, a reference to Mengele, for instance, which I said, I think that really has to come out. Um, and we fought over, the, and she finally said, I can't deal with it. If you want, if you really care about this, you're going to have to get on the phone with him. And I got on the phone with him, and I was like thinking, you know, how can I, what can I do to persuade him to make these changes so it can be in gourmet? And I said to, and I said to him, you know, you can take this anywhere. Anyone will publish this piece because it's brilliant. And you could take it to the New Yorker. And you can take it to the Atlantic or Harper's. I mean, I can think of 10 places where you could publish this. But you don't want to do that because you really want cooks to read this. And there was this long silence and he said, you're right. And then I was like, so I'd won this. And then I'm thinking, why did I win this? It would have been so easy if he just pulled it. And um, the night we went on press, I couldn't sleep because I thought, this is where I lose my job. I mean, this is going to, you know, half of our subscribers are going to write in and say, I, I, I cancel my subscription. This is, you've, you've really lost it. And then I will lose my job. And... Um, you want to know how many people canceled their subscriptions? Two. And I, would, I think about a thousand people wrote in to say how much they appreciated a magazine that respected the intelligence of its audience that much. And you know, one man said, if you have a lifetime subscription, sign me up because I want to support this kind of publication. And for me, it was such an important moment because it was do not ever underestimate your audience. I mean, I was, I was imagining what people's responses would be and our readers were so much better than that. And after that, nothing frightened me. Um, and we were so proud of that piece. And after that, you know, anything that, you know, you know we published a piece about how the workers who picked tomatoes in Florida were slaves. And, you know, it terrified my publishers, but um, it was a really important piece. The, um, the tomato pickers in Immokalee had been trying to meet with the governor of Florida for years, and after that piece ran, he met with them. And, you know, we published, we just, it was like, we will publish anything that, you know, uh, anything that is an important food piece, we will publish and our readers will come with us. That's great. So what is the difference, or how did you see it, as you were at Condé Nast and suddenly you had a driver, which is probably um, one of the best perks. It's a great perk. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I mean, I basically, I mean, I spent 10 years living in a commune in Berkeley. I think of myself as a 60s counterculture person. I spent my life working at newspapers. I mean, uh, people thought I was the restaurant critic of the New York Times. It's a glamorous job. The truth is, I took the subway to the three-star restaurants. Uh, I, I spent many multiples of my salary on restaurants when I was at the New York Times. I, I had never traveled first class or stayed in a fancy hotel. And, you know, there, there's one of my first moments at Condé Nast was before I got there, I was on book tour and I was standing in line to go to Los Angeles to promote the book. And David Remnick, the um, editor of The New Yorker and Paul Goldberger, their architecture critic, were standing in line near me and when they called the first class people, they turned around to include me, you know, say, you know, come on, let's get on the plane. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm not traveling. I'm, I'm not at Condé Nast yet. And, you know, Paul was shocked. I mean, what do you mean? I mean, you're, you're a Condé Nast editor now. And I thought, oh, I, I don't know how to be a member of this club. <laughs> and um, it, it the kind of privilege that I found at Condé Nast, I have to say, was shocking to me. I honestly didn't know that, I just had never known people like that who, um, 
just expected um, to be taken care of. And my secretary, and I had a big argument with my editor when we were, when we were editing the book. She said, you know, wait a minute, you, this is very old fashioned. Um, you should call her your assistant. And I said, no, 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 you don't get it. Robin was not my assistant. Robin was a secretary in the old fashioned sense that she thought her job was to take care of me and my family. And I mean, it was shocking to me to have someone, you know, dealing with personal things. You know, um, have you have you made sure you've baked uh, cupcakes for Nick's school? Um, uh, dealing with, you know, a point. I mean, she literally, when I went away, I wouldn't even know where I was going most of the time. She would hand me a folder and say, you know the driver will pick you up at X time and this is where you're staying and this, these are your tickets. And um, it's a shock to be taken care of when you're in your 50s and that has just never happened to you before. You're right. <laughs> but it's kind of nice. I know everybody who's ever had a car in government, they, that's what they like, this best, especially in New York City. Well, I the mean... The New York Times urges you to take a subway. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, you know, you the, the expenses are an issue, but I mean, actually one of the for me one of the most wonderful moments on book tour was my first day of book tour in New York City. I looked up and Mustafa, who had been my driver, was walking into the bookstore. And you know, I mean, it, those become very personal relations. Um I, I we I you know, I knew everything about his family. He knew everything about my family. We had dinner together. We still see each other. Um, there, there's something amazing about those relationships. So when you start doing a memoir like this, you don't just write it. Do you do, how do you go about organizing your time, doing your research? Okay, well, let me say that this is the first book I have ever written without an outline. I mean, usually when you sell a book, you have to write a pretty, a pretty concise outline of what you're going to do. This one, I basically walked into editors and said, the gourmet memoir, and they all said, yes, please. And so I started this book really, well, that's all I knew about it was that it was the gourmet memoir. And... I had gone into the job knowing that I would eventually want it. I mean, at that point, I had already written three, or three memoirs when I got to Gourmet. So I knew that I was going to write a memoir about these years. I knew it would be, it, I knew it was going to be interesting. Mm -hmm. And every day before I left the office, I would print out three or four emails I had gotten just so I would have a sense of what people were saying to me, who I was talking to, just so I would have a record. And I had them in a filing cabinet behind my desk. And in year five, I came in after Christmas, and my secretary said, you know that big mess behind your desk? I threw it all out. Oh, no. <laughs> and, uh, but I did have the last five years. I mean, she didn't ever touch anything <laughs> again. Um, and I am really, I mean, every issue we had folders. I mean, I have incredible notes. I had um, literally a folder on every trip, every issue. Um, I had all my calendars. Um, and I would, if something extraordinary happened, you know, when Cy came to tell me I was getting a new publisher, the minute he left my office, I would write down everything mm -hmm. that God said. So I had a really clear idea of what had happened. I just didn't know what I wanted the book to be. Well, let me just tell you, it's a great book, so you all should read it. I'll keep saying that. But you learned so much about when she wrote this, because don't forget, this was this book came late. It folded in uh, 1999. No, in, 19, in, in, in 2009. 2009. So even between 1999 and 2009, there was a, lots of change in the social media, and uh, you know. So yeah. So it, it it's very much. I mean, part of what I wanted it to be was that time. I mean, you know, literally, Condé Nast said to me. 
we want this to be the best Epicurean magazine that it possibly can be. Money is not an object. Hire anyone that you want. Um, get great writers. Get great um, photographers. And I thought, okay, they're not really going to let me do that when I get there. They really did. They, I mean, the time when a publisher would say to you, um, just do the best job you can and not micromanage you. I mean, they didn't. They really didn't. And in fact, there was a moment, and it's in the book, where we did a cover that was very different than anything that had ever been on an Epicurean magazine before. And I showed it to my boss, and he said, this is going to be a newsstand disaster. This, this will tank on the newsstands, but it's really important, and you should do it anyway. There is not a publisher in America who would say that today, who thinks of magazines as something more than just money makers, and who think of them as cultural objects. And I really wanted to write a kind of ode to the, this last gasp of publishing and yes, yeah. the characters that I worked with. I mean, Cy Newhouse is a fabulous character, and Steve Florio, who was the head of the ad side, there's never been anyone like him, and James Truman, who was my boss, the editorial director. These are three very strange men who <laughs> basically don't like each other very much, but <laughs> because of that tension made a, these were not bean counters. They were the opposite of corporate bean counters, and it was why that was such an astonishingly good moment for magazine publishing. But why were they so blind to the future? Um, I, I honestly believe that Cy Newhouse is a kind of genius, and I think he, was he could not imagine a world without magazines. He could not imagine a digital future, and he was not alone. I mean, now looking back, it's easy to see how much the digital revolution would change, but when you were in the middle of it, you couldn't, we, I mean, it hasn't been that long that we're all walking around with a computer in our pockets, you know, and when people first thought about iPhones, people said, you know, there's no way that everybody in the world is going to pay $100 a month to have this. Well, guess what? Um, you, you all know, over the world. All over the world. I mean, people are spend all their time looking down <laughs> when they're on the street. They're looking at... And I don't think any of us could have imagined that. Just as I still think most of us cannot imagine what the world is going to be like 10 years from now. Right. Um, you know, it's going to keep accelerating and advancing, and it takes an extraordinary imagination to see around that corner. Hmm. Okay. You dedicated your book to Lori Ashoa and her late husband, your and my good friend, Jonathan Gold, Gourmet's restaurant critic, and later the LA Times restaurant critic, who died very quickly of pancreatic cancer, devastating the entire city of Gold, his city, and the name of a documentary about him that played on Martha's Vineyard. In the dedication, you said that Jonathan blazed a path for an entire generation of food writers. I have two questions about Jonathan, the only food writer to win a Pulitzer. What do you think his legacy will be? And tell me, how, was he, how he was as someone you edited at Gourmet? How do you deal with food writers like Jonathan? How do you deal with any writer? Jonathan was deadline phobic. Jonathan never, ever met a deadline. Um, it was impossible. <laughs> um, and... Um, I mean, what Jonathan did, that, I mean, Jonathan is, has, we in the food world lost Tony Bourdain and Jonathan within weeks of each other, and in many ways they were similar. They were two extremely erudite, intelligent men who brought a lot more than just food to food writing. Um, Jonathan was one of the first... Uh, music critics to really understand rap and in fact, you know, he was good friends with Snoop Dogg and they gave him a name. They called him Nervous Cuz. <laughs> um, and um, he read philosophy. He read 
really widely. He loved like all kinds of art, all kind. I mean, he was just he was a culture hound, <laughs> and he brought all of that into his writing. I mean, he he demanded a certain kind of rigor when you read what he was writing, and what he mostly brought it to was to this is now uh, a word we don't use much in the food world anymore, but we don't, haven't come up with a better, to ethnic restaurants. I mean, he was mostly interested in taco stands and, um, you know, odd, you know, Korean black goat restaurants. And he introduced the city of Los Angeles to itself. He took, um, he, he took people who had never ventured out of their comfort zone and lured them into you know, places that they would never have thought of going because he made the food sound so compelling. And just as Tony Bourdain did and made people look at um, the world of food in a different way. And um, food writing has changed dramatically. I mean, there's a new generation of young food writers who see restaurants as much more than places to eat, as cultural institutions that are really important. And um, that is largely attributable to Jonathan and to Tony. Yeah. Even, if, I, I remember, it's really well said, Ruth, but I remember I asked Jonathan how he knew about Chinese restaurants before they even opened. He said, well, he, go, he goes to all these blogs in Chinese and he uses Google Docs to translate so he, he can be one step ahead of everybody. And, and the really interesting thing about Jonathan is um, he also hired kids, like Chinese kids who, who could read Mandarin and Cantonese to um, read these, these local uh, papers for him. So he would be the first at you know, some really obscure little Chinese restaurant out in Alhambra. And I went to one of these restaurants with him and I looked around and it was all young Chinese people. And Jonathan said with great satisfaction, these are my readers. And I said, what do you mean they're your readers? I mean, they're all Chinese. And he said, yeah, but they're all Chinese American and they all speak their parents' language, but none of them read it. And so they come to me. And I asked Francis Lam, who you may know who he is, he's a wonderful writer and um, does the Splendid Table now, and his first language is Cantonese, and he said, it's absolutely right. I mean, I, I, I speak Cantonese, I don't read it. And you know, when I wanted to know where to go in LA, I went to Jonathan's column. Hmm. Ruth, you're a cook, as well as one of the preeminent writers in the food world today. What makes you want to write, and what is your process in making you write? Has it changed over the years as you've gone from food writer to restaurant critic with different sorts of deadlines? I hate writing. <laughs> I, would do, I would rather do anything but write. But um, as many people have said, I love having written. <laughs> and there is no feeling as good <laughs> as you know, when you've had a great day writing. And it's like a drug. It keeps you writing. And the other thing is, you know, um, I, I am, I'm not that interesting. I only do a few things. I, I read, I write, and I cook. And I don't know what else to do if I'm not <laughs> writing. <laughs> okay. With social media today, given, giving the public so much of a chance to weigh in on everything, do you think restaurant critics are becoming obsolete? Absolutely not. Um, I mean, I think, first of all, I am definitely a populist. I love the idea of social media and people having to think for themselves. You know, in the days of Craig Claiborne, who pretty much invented restaurant criticism, there was one voice. If Craig Claiborne said a restaurant was good, everybody in New York went to that restaurant. Today, you know, you read Yelp, and if you have any intelligence at all, you know that some of them are written by the restaurateur's brother, and some of them are written by his competition, and that you better read it with, you know, a bit of salt. Um, but, um, so you, you sort of have to think for yourself, which is really good. 
And what it is mostly done for restaurant critics, for the people who are paid for their opinions, is they can't just be consumer reporters anymore. And you know, they they now are redefining themselves. So I mean, there's a really interesting woman in at the Chronicle named Saleh Ho, who really thinks of herself as um, someone who is that she has an important place in the conversation about food and that it, it also is about social justice. It's not just flavor and it's not just go spend your money here. And the the current crop of really good critics are, they're doing what is real criticism, which is giving you tools to evaluate your experience when you go to a restaurant. They're not just saying, this is good because I said so and you should go eat these three dishes. Which brings me to my last question. Question. In 1993, you published your first review in the New York Times about Le Cirque. It's, it started, being a new restaurant critic in town has its drawbacks. There are a lot of restaurants I haven't yet eaten in, but it also has its advantages. There are a lot of restaurants where I'm still not recognized. In most places, I am just another person who was reserved weeks in advance, and I still have to wait as more important people are waltzed into the dining room. I watch longingly as they are presented with the chef's special dishes, and then I turn and order from the menu just like everybody else. Could you tell us about this now, so famous review, and what you did? I, I told Ruth that this review will be on her obituary. It will. Uh, In so, her obituary. So, I mean, it started, I was on my way to New York. I was on an airplane on my way to New York to do research for my first review. And the woman sitting next to me said, I know who you are. And I said, oh, don't be ridiculous. You don't know who I am. And she said, oh, yes, I do. Um, I work in a restaurant. And there's a huge picture of you in the kitchen with wanted written across the bottom. And there is a bounty. They're, they're, the owner will pay $500 to anybody who recognizes you. I later found out that some restaurants were offering as much as $2,000. And I sat on the plane thinking, this is just wrong. I mean, my job is to tell people what will happen to them when they go to a restaurant, not what happens to someone for whom the red carpet is rolled out. So I got off the plane and I called my mother's oldest friend who was a theater uh, coach. And I said, Claudia, where do I go to get a wig? And Claudia said, you know, you just can't, you, if you think you're just gonna put a wig on your head, forget it, I'm coming over. And she came over and she said, who do you wanna be? And she made me, um, invent a person and then she took me to a wig shop and I mean this, this process took a while. Um, before I was done, I knew everything about this person. She was um, a middle-aged woman who came to, from the Midwest who came to New York um, four times a year to eat, in the, to eat in restaurants and go to theater. And her husband had made a lot of money in strip malls. And she was a little dowdy and so we went and got clothes for her and she had her own credit card and her own jewelry and her own pocketbook. And she, so when Claudia finally thinks that I'm ready, she and I go, I've made a reservation at Le Cirque and we go to Le Cirque and they look at these two dowdy women and basically say, we don't have your reservation. And I look at the reservation book and I say, yes it is, here it is right here. And he says, well, your, your table isn't ready. And go, go wait in the bar. And we wait 45 minutes, and they finally, they, this is, there were still smoking and non-smoking sections then. So we go, and we've asked for non-smoking, but we're in the smoking section. And the worst moment is the Le Cirque wine list is about this big. And it takes me a while to get a wine list. And I have just literally opened it up when the maitre d' comes and snatches it out of my hands and says, I need that wine list and gives it to a man four tables over. And Claudia and I go back uh, a few times and it never gets better. I mean, they always, they do not want these dowdy women there. 
And for my last review, I called my nephew who was working on Wall Street and I said, Johnny, will you make a reservation for Le Cirque? And he called me back and he said, well, I could only get a 945. And I said, well, that's fine, but let's go at eight. I, I will not wear a disguise. I know there's, a, there's one of those famous pictures in the back and let's see what happens. And we go in and there are all these people milling around, grousing about the fact that they've been waiting and their table isn't ready yet. And um, the owner sees me and he parts this crowd. And he takes my hand and he leads me forward and he says, my favorite words I have ever heard, the king of Spain is waiting in the bar, but your table is ready. <laughs> And the great thing is, I said to, John, to Johnny, oh, yeah, the, the king of Spain is waiting in the bar. And he said, no, that is the king of Spain. <laughs> and then they dance around, and can we do it? They give us a table for four, and can we, you know, can they do a meal for us? And there's black truffles and white truffles and champagne. And so I wrote the review in two takes. What happened to the ordinary person and what happened to the restaurant critic of the uh, the New York Times and it terrified my editors may I say terrified them okay. <laughs> we can take a few questions so if you want to come up to the microphones and make yourself brief I see chef Dion in the back try his wonderful um, oh, his, his it, Jamaican meat pasties are great. And the name of the book is Save Me the Plums, and you will be enchanted with it. It's a great, interesting read and wonderful, very doable recipe. Okay. I have read and loved every one of your books, and I want to know what's next. Um, I am currently working on uh, a novel. And Netflix has bought Comfort Me with Apples to do an eight-part series. So I'm working with the writer on that. Bon Appetit is targeted towards... Get closer. Bon Appetit is targeted towards high-income... Bon Appetit is targeted towards high-income, middle-aged and older readers. The website is targeted towards millennial women. Um, you talked in the book about Epicurious taking essentially your key content. Why did Bon Appetit, they could have done the same thing if they were going to bifurcate um, with Gourmet. And Gourmet is a known brand. I've never seen anybody reading Bon Appetit anywhere. Why did Bon Appetit, why were they chosen to compete with food and wine and you're gone? Okay. Um I can only, you know, Condé Nast is a privately held company. They didn't have to explain it to anyone, and they certainly didn't have to explain it to me. My guess is um, the, the ad strategy for Gourmet was always to attract luxury ads. Um, so we had our, our five top categories were automotive, banking, travel, um, small appliances and beauty. Um, th the idea was that, you know, Tiffany's did not want to be in the same ad environment as Campbell's Soup. So they never went after packaged goods. In a recession, and my, one of my publishers said to me, we are going to get hit really badly. Because, and I said, why? And he said, well, think about, think about it, Ruth. You know, if you're Tiffany's and you've been told that your ad spend is cut in half, are you going to cut Gourmet or are you going to cut Vogue? If you're Silver Seas and your ad spend is cut in half, are you going to cut The Traveler or are you going to cut Gourmet? He said, we, everybody is going to, we're, we're going to lose ads precipitously. And we did. In a recession, packaged goods do really well. You know, people st are still buying Campbell's Soup and um, Clorox and so forth. So our competitors did not lose advertising the way we did. And I think that their path back to recovery, every magazine did really badly in the recession, 
But I think their path back to recovery was faster than ours, and I think it was just a dollar and cent decision. I don't think it was a smart one. Hi. Um, I've read everything you've written, and I've always imagined your voice and your persona, though I've never heard you before, and I wouldn't recognize you in, in a restaurant. <laughs> and I have to tell you, I'm not disappointed. Oh, good. I'm, I'm so glad. I'm the least bit disappointed. <laughs> You're exactly what I imagined you were. So here's a, a thought, because you mentioned, you know, Tony Bourdain and losing him. Have you ever thought of eating with Ruth kind of show? Or are you even contemplating a blog? Not that I know exactly what that is, but are you <laughs> contemplating those kind of ways? Because I think you have a terrific personality. Not only good taste, ha ha ha, but a terrific personality. Well, thank you. actually I did. The, one of the ways we tried to save Gourmet was I did a show called Adventures with Ruth where I went around the world to cooking schools with various celebrities like Fran McDormand and we cooked. Um, Where was I? I didn't see that. Um, well, it, you know, because the magazine folded right before the show went on the air. And we also did three years of um, uh, Gourmet's Diary of a Foodie. Uh, they had 20 episodes a year. So they, they, PBS has them all somewhere. Okay. Ruth, uh, what's for dinner? <laughs> <laughs> well, were I cooking here tonight, which I am not, um, I would, you know, I've been looking at these farms and I love Larson's and we were in there the other day and it was a mo I saw the most beautiful piece of swordfish in there that I would probably throw on the grill and get some corn and some tomatoes and make a salad and what more do you need? <laughs> okay. I have one more question. You can't get there. <laughs> Questions for both of you. Did your parents have any role in your becoming chefs? If so, what did they l allow you to do? What did they do to encourage you or not encourage you to pursue careers in cuisine? Why don't you answer first? Right, well, first of all, we're not chefs. We're cooks. And we like to, to write. Um, I think well, one thing, we, there's a certain commonality. Um, we both have fathers who were born in Germany before then they came to this country before the war. And I, I, you know, from reading in this book and her other books, I realized, I, I don't know if we've even ever talked about it, but my father introduced me to the world of restaurants. And he loved talking to people in restaurants and, um, and, and loved eating. And so it was a chance for me to be with my father. My answer is a little different. I mean, um, if you, Tender at the Bone, which is my first memoir, there's a picture of a little girl cooking. I, I was seven. It's a picture of me. Um, my mother, the first story in Tender at the Bone is of my mother inviting people to a party and putting 26 of them in the hospital with food poisoning. <laughs> my mother was the world's most frightening cook. And my <laughs> earliest memory is of my mother going through the refrigerator, scraping the mold off and saying, you know, a, a little mold never hurt anyone. Uh, so I learned very early, one to taste very carefully. I mean, it was like you couldn't, it was like she trained me to be a restaurant critic. I mean, I still, my friends laugh at me. Everything I put in my mouth, I go, is this gonna kill me? <laughs> and I learned to, I pushed her away from the stove when I was seven and said, you know, I'm gonna do the cooking because at least I knew it wouldn't kill us. And, and my, we had a cook till I was about 13, but I, I loved home economics, and I don't know if you did, but we didn't have home in economics <laughs> in, at PS41 or Hunter. <laughs> this was in Mamaroneck Junior High School. That's where I took home economics, and I loved it, and I learned from there. And my mother learned to cook later and became a really good cook, but it was no, going out with my dad. My mother thought she was a great cook, but oh boy, was she not. <laughs> I mean, one, one of her great moments was, you know, she would buy, you know, you know the bargain ground beef and then, you know, make steak tartare out of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 
everybody, everybody. On that note. <laughs> please buy Ruth's book, and thank you for coming. Thank you so much. And the book is for sale. There's a book sale tent. And Ruth is going right over to the author signing tent and can sign that for you.